In Alaska doing a lawsuit, we're way out in the Aleutian Islands, getting ready to leave and go back to Anchorage and then home. A pastor came up and he said, listen, I can save you money. I said, how's that? He said, I flew a small airplane up here and I fly a small airplane and I can take you in my little airplane and you can save your ticket. Well, we went out to the airport, took us by his little plane and I looked at it and I thought, well, one good thing, it's shiny. Then he walked around it. We got in. He's on the left front. I'm on the right front. The other lawyer's sitting right behind me. And he started it up. And it started up just fine. Well, we taxied out. We started climbing and we flew probably three, four minutes. And something happened that will never leave my mind. The pilot turned to me and he said, we're going in the clouds and I can't fly in clouds. They make me pass out. I said, clouds make you do what? <laughs> now it's been cloudy all day. And we go right up into the clouds and you can't see anything. And he looks at me and his eyes roll back in his head and he starts mumbling and he passes out. Now we're in the clouds flying along with no pilot. And my friend in the back seat said, we're dead, aren't we? I said, there's a very good chance of that, yes. He said, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know. But there was a radio right there, and I handed him the microphone, and I said, start asking for help. So he's in the back seat reaching up, and he said, hello, hello. We didn't know any proper radio etiquette. All we were saying was hello. And somebody answered back, hello, hello. They said, well, the first thing we got to do is find you. And I'll never forget what this man at Anchorage said. He said, my job is to get you home safe. He said, that's my job. But he said, here's the deal. If you want me to get you home safe, you got to promise me you'll obey my voice. He said, you can't see me, but I can see you. And he said, if you're not going to obey my voice, you're going to die. And he said, I want you to hear me. I don't want you to look at what's going on outside. I don't want you to pay attention to the storm, just my voice. He said, if you start watching the storm, you will die. But I'll take you through it. Now, because they cleared all the traffic, several pilots, those nighttime freighters, those 747 started talking to us. They said, we're praying for you, men. You're going to make it. But listen to the voice. That's the key. They said, trust the voice. And then the voice came back and it said, now, I'm going to line you up. He said, I'm going to bring you in right down the runway. And at the foot of the runway are some lights, and they're in the form of a cross. He said, don't you forget this. The cross is the way home. Finally, just a couple hundred feet off the ground, we saw the cross. I landed the plane. In fact, I landed it seven times. Finally, it all came to a stop. And the minute we stopped, the pilot woke up. The voice said, thanks for listening. I watch them crash and burn all the time because they won't follow my voice. They don't understand I'm the one who can see them even when they can't see me. But they get the voices in their head and they kill themselves. They self-destruct. Thanks for listening to the voice. Then they put us in a motel room in about four in the morning the knock at my door and I opened the door and a man was standing there he said hello David I said you're the voice you're the one who got me home he said I am do you understand one day you're going to stand before him and say you were the voice you're the voice that brought me home all I can remember is that voice saying, stay with me, Amen. stay with me. Don't listen to what's going on in your head and don't watch the storm. Stay with me and I'll take you through. That is Dr. David Gibbs. Uh, who is actually a lawyer, he's not a pastor. Exactly a year ago, the first Sunday of 
September 2021. I was asked to preach. That's one Sunday I didn't want to preach because the Sunday before we had one of the longest congregational meeting in Lake Avenue history, which went up to five o'clock. I didn't have a choice. If I had a choice, I would have said no to that day to preach the Sunday after. And I preached a sermon called Following the Cloud. And to this day, that is the most referred to sermons I have preached at Lake Avenue. I still get, even last week I got an email with a picture of the sky and the cloud saying, Pastor Matthew, remember the sermon, I'm following the cloud. And the essence of that sermon it should be somewhere in YouTube or somewhere there in the website, but the essence of that sermon was the ambiguous nature of God's calling in our life. The journey that Israelites took, the famous Exodus story, when the cloud moved, they moved. When the cloud stopped, they camped. That's the way it worked. Following a cloud is not an easy thing because by definition, a cloud is clouded, cloudy, right? That's another word we use for ambiguity, right? Not only that, the cloud, a cloud hardly ever stands still. Sometimes you want to take rest, take a break from all this Christian thing, right? No, it keeps moving very often. It's just, even when it stands still, it's just rubbing up the engine, you know, like just ready to move. That's the nature of the cloud. And even worse, <laughs> cloud almost always changes its shape, right? You look at the cloud and you look at, you think it, it looks like a little girl and then the next time it looks like a car and it changes the shape and, and you think God is telling you something, you're almost set on it and you very proudly announced it, then the Lord said, no, you didn't hear it correctly. You had to hear it properly. So anyway, it kind of metamorph, metamorphosize into things so that's the journey God has called us to, to go. And so this summer, I was contemplating about the journey of the church in the same uh, season, the, the new fall season, and the Lord put, me, put that word into my, um, my soul and say, that is the message for the church. Now this is not a sermon, it is a series. So we are going to embark a series called Following the Cloud for the next three months, okay? We are going to follow the Israelites from, the, from their journey from Egypt all the way to the promised land, which means we are going to read the four books of the Bible. So that's the homework you have. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. All these four books, because that's the journey all the way from, so you have three months to read, four books, that's not too much to ask. And if you're too lazy to read, <laughs> this YouTube, you have this videos called Bible Project, and they do this summarized version of, don't ask me the theology of it, but the summarized version of each book. So if you go to our website, you know, they list some of the links to this video, so you can technically at least grasp the essence of each book in like five to six minutes. And if you're still lazy, you can watch movies like Ten Commandments or Prince of Egypt. <laughs> I don't endorse any theology. I don't endorse any movies from the pulpit. But it's not a bad idea to get the context. It's all, it, although it is very fictionalized version, it's really have, you know, very far away from the scripture. But that movie, that, that's what they are supposed to do anyway, right? So we will have this journey together. And I'm not going to preach today because today is a very, very special day as you have already seen. We spend some time praying for our leaders, elected leaders. I always used to wonder where are these elected leaders? Who are they? Because I don't normally attend the congregational meeting. If you don't attend the congregational meeting, you don't see them like most of you don't. So you got to see them, you can pray for them. We all prayed for them as leaders. But I want you today to spend some time praying for our community 
and the next season what the Lord is speaking to each of us in this journey together. Now I have said this, so what we are going to do today is kind of an exercise. I'm going to let you go early, okay? You get to go home, not go home, leave early, but I don't want to go home early. What that means is, today in the lobby, you will see some prayer stations. And we have something called a prayer garden. Have you ever seen the prayer garden we have? Yes. It's all the way up there. I want you to check it out. How many churches have the luxury to have a prayer garden? And we have one. And I talked to somebody who has been in this church for 30 years a few weeks ago. They never heard about it. Really? We have a prayer garden? That person has been here in 30 years in this church and never really went there. I mean, never really occurred to them. So it's a beautiful place. You can sit and you can meditate, pray, whatever you want to do in that prayer garden. And we are kind of recreate the day of prayer experience. So if you were here yesterday, even though it was a long weekend, we had a surprisingly big uh, group of people here yesterday. As you know, first Saturday of every month is our day of prayer. And one of the things I said in the congregational meeting, my overall ministry goal, the vision for the church is to create a culture of prayer. Not that we, we all pray, we always pray, and that's not, it's very different from having a culture of prayer, okay? So, first Saturday of every month, going forward, and as it is continuing, we have uh, a day of prayer. What we do, if you, if you don't come, what we normally do is we enter through the prayer garden. There's a prayer station called Pray Through Scriptures, so you can take a laminated sheet and there is a scripture version and there is a reflection question so you can read and pray through that scripture. And you can sit and, uh, and meditate through the scripture and it is a self-guided prayer time actually. So then you enter, we have something called a pathway. It looks like a nice little coffee shop right there. I want you to check it out, okay? That's why I'm leaving you early. And there we will all, always have a group of intercessory prayer partners sitting there. If you want somebody to pray with you, that's where people are available, intercessory prayer. Then you walk into the lobby, you, come, you can come through the lobby, there is a place called uh, Pray Through Music. There is a keyboard and there is a guitar and people can come and sing their prayers. It's all on yours. No pastor, nobody is going to be bothering you, but if there is somebody there, you, they can be part of this, but you can sing your prayer using the instrument if you can play the instrument. Then there is a prayer station called Pray for Our Community, which is actually our local Pasadena and other local ministry partners we have. You have some information about our ministry partners. There are flyers of that, what they do, and you look, look at them and reflect on them and pray for that ministry partners. Then the next station, there is another station called Pray for Our Church, and you have some pictures of some of these elected leaders and some of the ministry needs, some of the prayer requests for the church, and you can stand there or be around and take one of them, but leave that back because it's only a prayer prompt. You can pray in that station. Then you move further back and then you have a place called Pray for the World where you have the pictures of our missionaries who are making our footprints in different parts of the world. There are some information of the people group and different things about this world and the persecuted church and you can pray for the world in that station. You can be there. So this is what we typically do on a Saturday, and we did that last, uh, yesterday, Saturday, and we also did an evening, so if you are coming on a regular day of prayer, in the evening, 5.30 to 7, in the chapel, we have a gathering too. So we had an amazing gathering, Peter Gazanian, uh, an incredible worship leader, he has created this uh, musical version of Psalms, and I've hardly attended a worship kind of like that, reflective worship like that, and then my wife, Joanne, preached uh, last night. I mean, you missed all of that. I cannot recreate that, unfortunately. Uh, those who are not here missed all of that. But you still have the prayer experience. We, didn't, we did not take any of this out. So I want you to, when, you, when I leave you today, I want you to spend some time 
in the prayer garden and in the lobby praying through the station, okay? Because you, I mean, again, this is part of us creating a culture of prayer. That also means that when I leave you today, I am, I, I am going to request to leave in silence. Right? Remember when we do the Good Friday service, we ask you to leave in silence because I want a, a prayerful atmosphere here after the service. So if anybody wants to talk and anybody wants to catch up, make sure that you exit the glass door or be in the parking lot. Then you start talking, okay? Then you can talk. Otherwise, let us leave in silence and take some time to reflect. And if you want to stay in the sanctuary for a while, feel free to do so. But please don't talk when we leave, okay? Is that clear? Okay. Now, this is a communion Sunday. We are going to do communion now. And for communion and for a short devotion leading to communion, I'm going to read from two scriptures would you stand with me for the reading of the word? The first scripture passage is Exodus chapter 12, verses 21 to 23. And the second one will be 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Throughout this series, I'll be reading two scriptures, okay? And one from the Old Testament, which is the part of our story, and one from the New Testament, because how that story is reflected in the New Testament. By the way, when you sit down, if you don't have the communion cups yet, we have some ushers here, and they will hand it over to you when you sit down. Feel free to get it, because we will be doing communion right after uh, doing a short devotion. Exodus chapter 12, verses 21 to 23. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and take for yourselves lambs according to your families and slay the Passover lamb. You shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood which is in the basin and apply some of the blood that is in the basin to the lintel and the two doorposts. And none of you shall go outside the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into, the, into your house to smite you. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in, in fact unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Feel free to get, if you, anybody wants a communion cup, please raise your hand. They will hand it over to you. You probably heard about a movie called The Greatest Story Ever Told. It was a Hollywood blockbuster on the life of Jesus, because the life of Jesus is considered, even by the secular people, as the greatest story ever told. But if you ask a Jewish person, in your tradition, what is the greatest story ever told? They will say it is the Exodus story. And you can see in the Hebrew scriptures, it is repeated so many times that almost 3,005 years ago from today, Israelites were slaves in Egypt. The great King Pharaoh oppressed the Hebrews and they were slaves and then the Lord intervened in their life and took them from the slavery of Egypt, 
all the way to the promised land through the desert. And that's the story. And that's the story being repeated pretty much in every book of the Bible and every major saying of the prophets. And, and the Jewish people reenact that story every year through Passover, which is the celebration, the festival of the Jewish people. First month, 15th day, they celebrate the Passover on a regular basis. And that is what we read, where in the first Passover, the Lord instructed through Moses the deliverer to slain a Passover lamb, and then the blood of that lamb is to be applied on the lintel and the doorpost of the every house because God was sending destruction after destruction, famous 10 plagues, right? You remember the Sunday school story. And the final plague was an angel of destruction is going to pass by. And if there is no protection of the blood of the Passover lamb, if it is not marked on the lintel, uh, lintel and the doorpost of your house, then the angel of destruction will come and he kill you. And if it is there, then he will pass over so that you will be protected. Now, in the New Testament, Paul says this Passover lamb was actually a sign. The Passover was a sign that was pointing to the cross of Christ where the atonement, the ultimate delivery happened. And you know this, right? That's what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 7. Christ, the Passover lamb, is slain so that we have been delivered. Now that is interesting because even when the Jewish people in the first Passover, when they literally took the blood and applied that blood on the lintel and the doorpost, unwittingly, unknowingly, they were actually drawing a sign of cross in front of their door. I don't know how many of you have come from a liturgical tradition. I was born in an Orthodox Christian family, Syrian Orthodox Christ Christian family, much like the Russian or Greek Orthodox or Armenian Orthodox we see. We have the tradition of drawing the sign of cross before we do everything, like Catholics do. And that's the first thing we do. You know, get up in the morning and before we eat meal, we don't pray, we don't do anything. Even if you do a bad thing, before we do that thing, we have to do this. This is the sign of the cross, you know. Somehow that absolves us. That, that's ingrained in every little boy and girl as we grow up. It's a sign of the cross. And it is methodical. You cannot do like this. You know, you have to do like from here, like this, and this, and this is how it goes. That's a sign of the cross. Believe it or not, that's what they did in the first Passover. The man, the father of the house who did that, you put the hyssop, dipped it in the blood of the Passover lamb, and he did this, and then he did this, and then he did this. And if you Google some of the you know, pictures of the first Passover, and it's interesting because the blood will be oozing out from this, from this mark, because this is literal blood you're talking about, blood of the lamb. So the man who put it, you know, blood here, the blood will come down like this, you know, drop like this. And then he does this, and the blood goes to here because he takes the hesop. This is not an actual paint, calligraphy paint or anything like that. So the blood will be all over the door like a cross, literally like a cross. Now, of course, it's a symbolism. Of course, we are reading into it. But it is interesting that the first Passover somehow pointed to the sign of the cross, lintel, doorpost. Lintel, doorpost. That's what we do. Lintel, doorpost. And that's what happened in the first Passover. And in the New Testament, we realize that the Passover was a shadow where Jesus was the substance. 
Passover was a sign that pointed to what happened on the cross, which was the actual suspense, the substance. And because of that, now we are reenacting. We are not really reenacting when we do communion. We are actually symbolically remember the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ or the slain, you know, the, the death of the passive, the, the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. In a strange way, in a strange way, when we do communion, we have this integral connection to the Jewish tradition where they remember the Exodus story. Each time when they do Passover and the Jewish people are telling, the Exodus story repeats itself every day because Exodus story is a historical fact, but it also has a symbolic value. It also has a metaphorical significance because Exodus is where we live right now today because Jesus delivered us. The blood of the Passover lamb delivered us but we have not yet in the promised land. We are somewhere stuck in the wilderness and we are following the cloud. We are following the cloud. And we cannot see him. We cannot see God, but he can see us. That's the video. And be assured that this cloud might be ambiguous. We feel that we are in an unsown land. We in this unfertile land. There is all we have is problem because we are in the wilderness. But there is somebody who can see us. He has already given us the sign and also the symbol for the same substance. I want you to get that words right. You have a sign that points to the cross for the Old Testament saints, which was the Passover. Now for us, we have already seen it. Now what we have is a symbol. And the symbol is still going back to the same substance, which is the death of Jesus Christ, and which is telling us, and the Passover lamp has already saved us. Now he is calling us onto a journey through the wilderness where Exodus story repeats itself. Let's be part of this communion. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's have it together. In the same way, he took the cup and said, this is the new covenant in my blood established by the shed blood of Christ and do this in remembrance of me. Let's bring this together. Father God, thank you for inviting us to the most expensive meal ever shared in this world. Thank you for inviting us to be part of the greatest story ever told in this world. Lord, irrespective of what happens around us, in our world, as a community of saints, we proclaim that the way home is the cross. The cross is the way home. We know that as we follow the cloud, we cannot see you, but thank you for the assurance that you can see us. You will take us through. So as a community, Pastors, elected leaders, volunteers, members, partners, adherents, just visitors, it doesn't matter. All of us come together today to say that we re rededicate ourselves to follow the cloud, to be part of this Exodus, Exodus journey that repeats itself. And thank you for the Passover lamb that has been sacrificed for us. May it never be that we will boast except 
in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. First Sunday of the month, we have the tradition of taking benevolence offering, which is used exclusively for charitable activities in our community. As you walk outside, you will see that uh, you have the opportunity for offering. Uh, I'm not going to do benediction today. The benediction will be outside. Our worship team will be singing benediction. So they will be praying through the music. So feel free to exit in silence and walk around, take some time to pray for our community, all of us, for the world. May the Lord bless you.